added the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. The right to privacy and protection against unreasonable search and seizure. Without due process and the right to privacy, each of us is essentially living at the mercy of the surveillance state. All this in the name of stopping a terrorist threat blown wildly out of proportion. Obama's foreign policy seemed more reasonable than Bush's, repudiating the unilateralism and preemption that had so outraged world opinion. But the goal, embracing U.S. global domination, differed little, and even the means were frustratingly similar. In 2011, Bush's former NSA and CIA director, General Michael Hayden, took comfort in the powerful continuity between two vastly different presidents saying that Americans have found a comfortable center line in what it is they accept their government doing. He called it a practical consensus. His own experience in Foreign Affairs Limited, Obama surrounded himself with hawkish advisors. Among them, Bush holdover Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, a hardliner from the Bill Casey CIA era of the 80s. Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State was equally hawkish. In an early speech, Clinton presented a version of American history steeped in unvarnished triumphalism and historical amnesia. So let me say it clearly. The United States can, must, and will lead in this new century. The Third World War that so many feared never came. And many millions of people were lifted out of poverty and exercised their human rights for the first time. Those were the benefits of a global architecture forged over many years by American leaders from both political parties. It would be difficult to find and ask the millions killed over many decades of American interference in their countries what they thought. The people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Philippines, Central America, Greece, Iran, Brazil, Cuba, Congo, Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Chile, East Timor, Iraq, and Afghanistan, among others. In Afghanistan, Obama, calling it a war of necessity, doubled down on Bush. Pressured in late 2009 into sending more troops, he wavered. He was told by a military advisor, I don't see how you can defy your military chain here, meaning that his high command might resign in protest. CIA Director Leon Panetta told him no Democratic president can go against military advice, especially if he asks for it. So just do it, he recommended. Do what they say. When it came down to his decision, Obama did not show the courage of a John Kennedy. In December, he announced another 30,000 troop increase to reach almost 100,000, about the same number the Soviets had deployed in their disastrous invasion of Afghanistan. He announced the troop increase at West Point, reminding the cadets that the U.S. had invaded Afghanistan because it had provided sanctuary for al-Qaeda. But he neglected to mention that most of the preparations for 9-11 took place not in Afghanistan, but in apartments in Germany and Spain and flight schools in the U.S. Or that only 50 to 100 of al-Qaeda's 300 cadre were actually left in Afghanistan, and that most were now in Pakistan, an ally. That the president waging two wars would receive the Nobel Peace Prize that same month was surreal in the first place. But when the world heard Obama's defense of American unilateralism and preemption, the meaning of the prize had been diminished, as it had by Kissinger 36 years earlier. I believe the United States of America must remain a standard bearer in the conduct of war. That is what makes us different from those whom we fight. Obama feared getting bogged down in Afghanistan as Johnson had in Vietnam. What the backward, dirt poor, overwhelmingly illiterate Afghans needed was economic aid, education, and social reform. The U.S. spent $110 billion on military programs in 2011, but only $2 billion for sustainable development. With big U.S. money floating around, as in Vietnam, corruption reached epic proportions. Mistrust between the supposed NATO and Afghan allies soared, 
the U.S.-backed President Hamid Karzai announced that he would support Pakistan if it should go to war with the U.S. By 2012, Afghan soldiers and police were killing U.S. troops with such increasing regularity that the forces had to be increasingly separated. Meanwhile, bedraggled, demoralized U.S. forces left Iraq in December 2011. Almost 4,500 U.S. troops would not come home. More than 32,000 wounded, many of them severely. Iraqi death counts ranged from 150,000 to over a million. Two million Iraqis fled the country. The irony was exquisite. In deposing the Sunni Hussein, the United States had turned the new Shiite-dominated Iraq into a valuable ally of Iran, which ended up the war's biggest winner. Bush officials had estimated the Iraq war to cost 50 to 60 billion dollars. Rumsfeld had called anything above 100 billion baloney. By 2008, when Bush left office, the U.S. had spent some $700 billion on the war, not including long-term care for veterans. Economists project total long-term costs as high as $3 trillion. Obama welcomed the troops home at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, ensuring that the end of the war would be as dishonest as its beginning. But we're leaving behind a sovereign, stable, and self-reliant Iraq. Unlike the old empires we don't make these sacrifices for territory or for resources we do it because it's right never forget that you are part of an unbroken line of heroes spanning two centuries to your grandparents and parents who faced down fascism and communism and delivered justice to those who attacked us on 9-11 thus sanctioning once again bush's lie about the connection of 9-11 to Iraq. The words were barely out of his mouth before Iraq was racked with a new series of deadly suicide bombings. To this day, Iraq teeters on the edge of civil war. Among the two war's fiercest critics were the nation's mayors, who gathered in Baltimore in June 2011 and called for using $126 billion in savings from these wars to rebuild the nation's cities. The mayor of Los Angeles was quoted as saying, that we would build bridges in Baghdad and Kandahar and not Baltimore and Kansas City absolutely boggles the mind. For the American people, deadened to these wars, a single bright spot in this foreign miasma came in May 2011. A bold cross-border raid at night by Navy SEALs killed Osama bin Laden, living comfortably in the shadow of Pakistan's premier military academy. In the euphoria the raid created in the US, celebrating the skill and power of the SEALs who had executed bin Laden vigilante style and dumped his body at sea. A new profile was created for Obama as, unlike Bush, an effective war president who would, by any means necessary, hunt down the enemy. In fact, really a wolf in sheep's clothing. After a firefight, they killed Osama bin Laden and took custody of his body. A celebrated movie even implied torture as effective in finding bin Laden. Though, in fact, it had been ordinary police and espionage work that located him after almost 10 years. Forgotten country. Geronimo was KIA. <laughs> oh my God. Nonetheless, America's capacity for self-love was again in full flower. And there were no troubling discussions of bringing a wounded bin Laden back for imprisonment and trial, as the United States had done at Nuremberg, where the Nazi defendants were unmasked and diminished. But a trial was the last thing most Americans wanted. Those who accepted torture could tolerate vigilante justice. But who was the real victor here? After estimated trillions of dollars spent, two wars, hundreds of thousands of dead worldwide, an endless war on terror, the loss of civil liberties and confidence in one presidency and the near collapse of the empire's financial structure along with it, it can be said by a neutral observer 
that at the least the U.S. had won a Pyrrhic victory in which its losses had made victory pointless.